All right, morning. Smaller and smaller group here. Let's try that again, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, everybody had a nice weekend. All right, uh, back to winter, I guess. Uh, if so, if you look at the calendar, we only have one week of class left. So we're going to do finish up performance today. We're going to talk about virtualization on Wednesday and Friday. Next Monday, we will do review for the final exam. If you look outside, it looks like we have months of class left. So, um, All right, so the final exam, people have asked about this. I sent an email about it just to remind people. It'll be Monday, so it is two weeks from today at 8 a.m. So apparently, whoever schedules these things thinks you guys are gluttons for punishment. Right? So, but you guys, you know, people who are here, the 10 of you, um, should be good at getting up in the morning to come to class now. So this will be similar to that, except an hour earlier. Right? Sometimes that hour just makes a little bit more difference than we wish it would. So um, you know, I thought maybe, actually, maybe, maybe what I'll do is the following. To help people uh, with this task, maybe next Monday we'll have class from 8 to 10. And we'll, we can do exam review for you know, an hour and 45 minutes or something. So I will, I will consider this to see if an extra week of like, building will help people uh, get up and, and be bright and wide awake at 8 a.m. Um, the format of the exam will be similar to the midterm. Um, so you know, short answer questions, a couple of longer sort of design problems, uh, maybe a few multiple choice here and there, but not, not too many. Right? So any questions about the exam? How many people are able to take the exam at the scheduled time? Actually, maybe I should ask the converse. How many people are not able to take the exam at the scheduled time? OK, good. I know there's at least one person, so there probably will be an alternate exam. But if you don't have a good reason to take it, please don't. All right. OK, so we spent last Wednesday and Friday, apparently, with me very slowly going through uh, fairly obvious stuff about measurement and benchmarking. So today, I want to speed up a little bit, get through this. Um, get us out of this little performance uh, unit that we blundered into. So any questions about measurement and benchmarking from last week's material? We talked about some of the challenges in measuring things on real systems in terms of reproducibility and just terms of getting access to the kind of uh, fine-grained time information you might want. And then we talked a little bit about benchmarks, different types of benchmarks, choosing the right benchmark for a problem, et cetera. So any questions on measurement and benchmarking? All right, so we're not actually not going to do too much review. Instead, I'm just going to try to give you guys a big picture overview of where, where we are, right? So what have we managed to accomplish so far? We set out to improve the performance of our system, right? And what we've talked about is the first thing that we discussed was how do you measure things, right? How do you actually measure things on the system so that we can collect any sort of data, right? In order to collect data, there's this process process of measurement that we have to, to go through. And so we discussed measurement. And we also talked about some alternatives to measuring real systems in terms of modeling or simulation. All right. The next thing we did was we talked about how to choose a benchmark. So the first thing is how to instrument and measure either a real system or a simulator or, or uh, you know, an analytical model. And then the second question was, what are you going to measure that system doing? So we talked about benchmarks. We talked about micro benchmarks. We talked about macro benchmarks. We talked a little bit about application benchmarks. And, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll come back to these a little bit today as we go through some of the extra material. So this is where we are. right? We've, we've figured out how to measure the system. And we've decided what the system is going to be doing while we measure it. Okay? And then today, what we're going to do, well, OK, I mean, I'll, I'll pose the question. Now what do we have to do? right? So now you have a system that you can measure. You have something for it to do. What are the next steps? What's the next thing that we need to do? Anybody? What's that? Start to test. Start to test. OK, right. So I'm going to start gathering data. And then what am I going to do? This side of the room. I hear things from the other side, but I'm not listening. I'm just listening to this side. So you start to collect data. Then what do you do with the data? OK, so I might, I might use some statistical techniques to do what? But what am I trying to do? I'm trying to take the data and, and do what? Analyze. Analysis. Analyze the data, right? 
So I'm going to analyze the results. I'm going to run some experiments. Right? I'm going to collect some data. I'm going to analyze the results. Then, then what am I going to do? Now I've got some results. What, well, what was the whole point of this thing in the first place? Left side of the room. Again, I can hear muttering from over there. They're so eager. Whispered in my ear. I know you know the answer. <laughs> you don't know. OK, analyze the results. Then, then what? What was the whole point of this exercise in the first place? What's that? Benchmark. Well, I ran the benchmark, right? So I did. I chose and run the benchmark. I collected some results. I analyzed the results. Now what am I going to do? Use it to improve the system, right? Yeah. You know, I'm going to decide what to improve, right? And I'm going to make some changes to the system, OK? And now what's the, last, what's the last step? I don't know if there is a last step on this slide, but I'm going to pretend there is a last step. Then I'm, I'm going to make some improvements, right? I'm going to make some changes to the system. Now what do I have to do to know that the changes really had any effect? Test it. I need to test again, right? So I need to go back and, and restart, this, restart the cycle, right? Go up to the top, pick up my benchmarks again, rerun them, analyze the results, and try to draw a conclusion, right? So essentially what we're doing is a form of experimentation. This is, this is in some ways very analogous to the scientific method that is used by other fields, right? Here, though, the, the, the change or the hypothesis, the hypothesis that we have is that we can improve the system by making some change to a certain component. Right? And that the test that we're going to carry out to, uh, to examine that hypothesis is you know, running a benchmark, collecting results, and seeing if the system speeds up or not. Right? There's one interesting difference, I think, and it's worth pointing out here between you know, what I would call the scientific, sci scientific method and the computer scientific method. Right? And this is an interesting uh, observation that's important when you guys start to build real systems. Is that in nature, something is true or it's not true. Right? I mean, there's some underlying ground truth to the world, and that's what scientific experiments are trying to discern. When we start talking about engineering, we, you know, who's, who's making these changes? Like the underlying order of the universe is making the change? No. Who's making the change? Some poor SAP programmer, right? You know, like you or me, OK? And so you know, I, I think that there's interesting results in the history of computer science where you start to realize that just you know, the problem is two things get mixed together. One thing is, is something a good idea or not? The second thing is, did people do it the right way or not? Right? Did people succeed in, in doing it correctly? So it's possible I can have a hypothesis about a type of software implementation. I can go off and build it, and it doesn't perform very well. right? And the fault is not that the idea was bad. The fault is that I made a bunch of mistakes when I implemented it, and it turned out not to work very well. Right? So just keep that in mind. Right? OK. So any final questions about where we are before we blast on forward? Going once, going twice. All right. So. Statistics, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe this is just me sort of uh, giving myself kind of extended help session here. But um, I, I think that you know, if you look at the, the papers that come out of the computer systems community, um, we have somewhat of a, you know, a tortured relationship with statistics, shall we say. Right? Uh, you know, uh, some of the statistical practices that are in use still today in the computer systems community, I think, are not necessarily the strongest. Right? And at least speaking for myself alone, right? Um, you know, one of the reasons I ended up doing computer systems as opposed to other things was that I was too dumb to do mathematics, right? I was too dumb to do math, and then I tried doing physics, and I was too dumb for physics too, uh, and then I ended up in computer science, right? So, um, and where where I feel like maybe I have some some degree of refuge from from mathematics, right? Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, that, that that only goes so far. Math. It, it, Math is one of those things. It's everywhere. You know? it, it turns up in all sorts of places, maybe even places that you wouldn't like it. Um, but you know, again, I mean, from a, um, these are just observations uh, from my time in the computer systems community. You know, running an experiment multiple times, right? I mean, that's woohoo. That, that's like a, you know, a badge of honor, right? I, I didn't just run my experiment once, see an improvement, and then immediately declare victory, right? So this is kind of the beginning here. And then you know, maybe, maybe if I'm feeling super generous statistically, I'll put error bars on my graph. Right? That, that'll be kind of like the super bonus points, right? a little bit of extra special sauce. Right? 
And of course, I'll only put the error bars on the graph if they're small, right? If they're big, then I'll forget to put them on the graph, right? Um, all right, so I think that we, uh, all this sort of like uh, responsible human beings and, and, and responsible systems engineers or future systems engineers or future systems programmers can just aspire to do better, right? So on some level, just this is an aspirational wish for all of you and your future as programmers, right? Uh, you know, do, do better with statistics, right? Try, try to get to the real bottom of things. Um, so the, the first thing that I find helpful to do when I'm analyzing a system or thinking about how a system is going to behave under a certain set of experiments is make some set of predictions about what's going to happen, right? So one of the things you can do is you can just say, OK, I'm going to collect some results and I'm going to try to produce a certain type of data visualization or graph. And so I'm just going to draw a picture of what I think that graph is going to look like, right? Based on my intuition about the system and what I think is true, you know, here is the graph, and you just draw it on a whiteboard, or you draw it on a piece of paper, and you can say, here's what I think it's going to look like, OK? Then you collect data and you, and you see what happens, right? So again, one way of doing this is just draw a picture, right? Draw a sketch of the graph that you think is going to come out from a particular set of experiments. The reason to do this is because it helps develop your own intuition. So, and, and on, on the other hand, I mean, you have to be careful with this, because if the results come out the way that you thought they would, that's not necessarily an indicator that you understand the system, right? You may have made an erroneous set of assumptions about the system, and it just happened that the data looked like what you thought it looked like. But at least this helps you when you're completely wrong, right? If, if your prediction of what the graph is going to look like and the actual graph are totally different, then something is wrong, right? Usually the problem is your own intuition about the system, right? I would say that's probably the problem, I don't know, Nine, 19 times out of 20, right? The other 5% of the time, something's wrong with the experiment, right? Something's wrong with the experiment. Somebody goofed up, the simulator's broken, the data wasn't collected properly, whatever, right? But this is a good, this is a good way to do things. The other thing you could do, especially when you're working with simulators and analytical models, but also when you're working with real systems, is predict, make predictions about simple cases and make sure that those simple cases that you think you fully understand look right when you actually start to do the, the data visualization, right? So if the system doesn't pr behave the way you think it will in really, really, really simple cases, then the corner cases and the weird things and the stuff that you're trying to figure out, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be kind of really lost, all right? So the, sec the second big thing I think that, that, that we're, you know, people are guilty of is early and premature use of, of summary statistics, right? So summary statistics is a summary statistic is any sort of statistic that you know uses a single number or a small set of numbers to summarize a large number of data points, right? So things like computing the average, right? I, I ran the experiment a hundred times, and I took an average, and you know I and I, I you know I that that was it, right? Or or even you know averages I I think are, are particularly cruel because averages. Have, are almost meaningless statistics, but, but a mean, oh, sorry, means are averages. Uh, the median, right? So I computed a median, okay? I mean, at least a median has some sort of really well defined statistical mean, right? These can frequently hide a lot of important information about the data that you've collected, right? And if you don't look at that data directly, you can miss a lot of things, right? So for example, I'm going to show you two different sets of data, you know, it doesn't matter what these data are from, right? They're just random things I collected off the internet. I don't know what the data is from, right? But I'm going to show you two graphs that have very, or could have very, very, very similar summary statistics, right? Same mean, same median, right? So here's one, okay? So this is, you know, a, a very narrow, you know, well-peaked distribution. It's got some error, right? But, but basically this, this, is, this is, you know, some variable that I'm measuring that looks like it's fairly consistent, right? Who can guess what the next graph's going to look like? Anybody want to guess? What about that? So here's a bimodal distribution, right? So this graph, there's two things going on here, right? Imagine you're, again, you're studying something like page fault performance, right? And you get this graph, right? You measure page fault handling time, and you get this graph on the left, right? What is this graph saying to you? What does this graph say to you? Anybody? Carl? Small standard deviation. 
looks like it's pretty small standard deviation. So there's some consistent performance that the system ex is experiencing, right? Every time, and this is probably not what you would see if you collected something about page fault statistics, because there's different cases in here. But this looks like something consistent is happening every time. There's some error in the measurements that's causing a little bit of spread. That's normal, right? But, but there's some consistent phenomena here. What about the graph on the right? Anybody? What, is, what does that graph say to you about underlying mechanism? What's happening on this system? You guys better watch out. I'm behind you. <laughs> Anybody? What's happening? Is there, is there some single thing that's going on on this system? No. In fact, there's, there, what it looks like is there's probably at least two different cases that are, that are mixing in your data set here, right? There's something that's causing the system to behave like this. Some, you know, some code path or some particular set of circumstances or inputs are causing the system to look like this. And there's a whole other set that are causing it to look like that, right? If you, so if, again, if you took the average of these data sets, you could get the same number, right? And it's possible, depending on the spread, if you took the standard deviation, you could also get the same number, right? So without looking at these data sets, you can't tell what's going on, right? And the set of techniques that you're going to apply to improve the performance of the system that looks like the system on the left and the system on the right are different, right? The system on the right, you know, maybe if I make this guy go away, right, maybe there's some bug that's causing this, this distribution over here, right? So anyway, the point is that look at the data, right? Look at the raw data. Graph, you know, do histograms. Look at, you know, probability uh, distributions. Like, look at the data itself before you start computing any sort of summary statistics, right? If you don't, this will happen to you. There was a, you know, my, um, the woman who taught this class at, at Harvard before me has a famous story about a paper they were writing, and you know, she was supervising a, a research assistant, and he was, he kept saying, oh, and she kept asking him about this one number in the, in the paper. She kept saying, you know, why is the standard deviation so high? And he kept saying, oh, it's cash effects, right? You know, like something, you know, whatever, I don't know, it's just, and then they finally looked at the data, and it looked like this. You know, there were these two, you know, peaks with a massive valley in between of them, and it turned out that there was a really good explanation why this was happening. There were two, you know, separate paths in the code that were causing extremely different performance, right? And and you know, it just just because he had already come to some sort of convenient conclusion, the research assistant was very, you know. Uh, grumpy about having to actually look into things more carefully. And when he did, he finally found out that there was something really interesting happening. Right? So, so don't, don't, don't miss the chance to look at you know, data directly before you start to compute uh, more uh, aggregate statistics. All right. Outliers are, outliers are themselves really important. Right? So who, who can tell me what an outlier is? You guys didn't take statistics, or you weren't forced to take statistics, so Sean. Extreme data point, right? So, you know, we go back here, right? An outlier would be like this if there was a little bump, this is a new thing, right over here, right? And, you know, I mean, I, peep, peep, outliers are annoying, right? Outliers cause the deviation for your data to go way up, which is irritating when you're trying to convince yourself that it's a nice and tightly packed distribution. Outliers tend not to fit into theories that you have about data, right? I mean, you come up with a theory that explains, you know, this and explains this, but what about this little blip over here? What happened? This might have only happened once when you ran the experiment. One time, right? You got this bizarre, you know, uh, anomalous result, okay? It's really, really tempting to just ignore that, right? Cut them off, you know, t take the graph and just trim off that part of the graph, right? You know, don't include them when you run your statistics. Just assume, well, something weird happened, you know. Somebody probably inputted the data wrong, or there was some bug in the timing code or something, right? And, and you know, that, that, maybe that's true, right? But I think that outliers d usually uh, deserve better than that, right? You should be kinder to them, right? They are different. They're they're weird, right? They don't they don't like to like run with the with the pack, so they can be annoying to have to go deal with. You know, they're like the proverbial sort of lost sheep that keeps wandering off, right? 
but go get that sheep, man, you know? Uh, you got to, like, go find out what's going on. Why does he keep wandering over there? Maybe there's something really cool. I'm taking this metaphor too far, clearly. Um, but the point is that you should, you should take care of your outliers, right? Take care of them. Be good to them. They, 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 you may need to cut them off. You may need to say, you know what, as far as I can tell, you're just not that interesting. You know, you're just confused, right? And this just was some sort of weird measurement bug or whatever. But before you do that, you need to spend more time with them and you need to try to understand. Oh, cra crazy guys, crazy data. All right. Okay. So now, so now we're kind of to the to the more fun parts, right? So you know, this has been so boring so far, right? I mean, we we you know we spent all this time worried about how to measure things, and then um, you know now we we just got through the statistics part, which is also terrible. It's like preachy and boring. Um, so now, okay, great. We're to, we're to the fun stuff, right? So now you just have to, you've run all your uh, experiments, you've run some benchmarks, you've collected data, you've, you've, you've spent time carefully looking at the data, and now, hey, just improve the slowest part of your system, right? This is easy. I, I ran all the measurements. I can see what the slowest part is. So this is what I do, right? No. Who said no? Why not? Oh, right. OK. Yeah, OK, so I just want to point something else out. Um, so even if this were this simple, right, getting programmers to do anything is impossible, right? Like if you, you know, they're kind of like mechanics, right? If you tell them, hey, go work on that piece of code, they're like, why, right? I like this other piece of code. This is going to be more fun to hack, right? So, so anyway, it's maybe, I don't know, maybe this is more sociological, right? Um, but, but, the, but the fact is, actually, one, one of the sort of deeper lessons here is that despite the fact that you, you know, this is, this is going to happen to you, right? You are going to write a piece of code, and as you're writing it, you're going to think, man, you know, I could do better over there. And I, you know, I remember I took this, this class in college, and he always said, keep it simple. So I used a really dumb data structure over there. And I think this part can be improved, and that part could be sped up. And then someone's going to actually come and ask you to improve the performance. And normally when you talk to programmers about improving your performance, they've got the list of things to do in their head already, right? They've got the 10 things queued up that they know are going to improve the performance of the system, right? Because as they were building the code, they were leaving little breadcrumbs in there saying, oh, I don't think this works, I don't think this works. It turns out that they're wrong all the time, right? And, and so, and this is, this is the big, you know, this is the, the, the big pitfall here, right? Is that someone can come to you and you can go off and you can do the stuff that you think is going to improve performance, right? You know, why run experiments? Why, why actually have to find a benchmark and use it? I know what's slow about the system, right? I'll just go fix those parts, right? It turns out that, that, that there's a massive gap between what programmers think is slow about a system and what is actually slow about even their own code, right? All right, but we've already done the right thing. We ran all the experiments, we collected data. Okay, so now why, why would we want to improve the slowest part? So let's do a little thought experiment here. You know, you, you took my advice not to write all of your code for a big software project in one function. Instead, you wrote it in two functions, right? You wrote one is called foo, and the other is called bar, all right? And foo takes five minutes to execute bar. You, and you've, you've measured this, right? You ran benchmarks. You collected data. You know, you, you, at first, you lump these two together, but then you realize, oh, man, they're really different. So what you realize is foo takes five minutes to execute. Bar takes five seconds to execute, OK? So again, I'm going to vote. Let's work on foo, right? Five minutes. What is going on in there, right? What, what could it possibly like? What, five? What, we, we, like running this on like a two-bit machine or something, right? All right. So so this this looks like it's terrible, right? So right, we're going to clearly immediately start working on foo, right? No. No. Carl says no. Michael said no too, right? So we've missed two. There's actually two elements that we've missed here, right? One is what Michael pointed out. The slowest part of the code, if it's never being actually executed, will not slow down the system. And even if it is executed from time to time, it may not be bottlenecking the system. Right? What's the other interesting? Uh, so again, you're, you're a programmer. You have a limited amount of time. You, know, you want to be done 5 PM Friday so you can finish, go home. You know, what, what, what's the other? piece of the puzzle that we've missed here, right? What's the other variable that you don't know when you start something like this? <laughs> OK, who might be expected, but what about your time? 
What about your time? What's, what's, another, what's another element here? Like, what, what do you really want to maximize in this situation? Okay, an analysis time, right? I'm going to improve, include improvement time. So there's some, there's some trade-off here, right? The, the, what, what is the thing that we want, right? We want the performance to improve, right? We want a change in performance. What's the thing that we're spending? Our time, right? Yeah, well, I mean, in, in this case, it's program or effort, right? So maybe it takes you know, 30 seconds to improve foo from five minutes to one, right? Or it would take 30 days to get one second off of bomb. I can't remember which one is which. But anyway, all right. So the first is significance, as Michael pointed out. How much does foo actually matter, right? So that, that we need to determine before we actually can make a decision, right? Because that's going to help us guide our, our efforts in terms of what to improve, right? The second thing is difficulty. How long is it going to take? to improve foo or bar. Now, there are two things here, but which one of these are you likely to know more about right now, at this stage in the process? You've run the experiments, you've got some data. What, what, can, we, what can we evaluate and, like, you know, mathematically, analytically at this point? And what are we going to have to guess at? What's that? Right. So we're going to focus on significance because significance is something that we can, um, we can measure and we can actually know. Difficulty, again, you can ask the programmer, but who knows, right? You just you don't really know how, how hard it's going to take. So the, the best thing to do is to start on the part that's causing the problem, all right? So let's start with significance. All right. How many people have been exposed to Amdahl's law before in any setting? Raise your hand. OK, a couple. Oh, good, a lot of people. All right. So you guys, you guys should know this, right? I mean, you, you, this should be like one big punchline I've been building up to that now feels sort of, sort of boring, right? Um, there's a, there's, there are many, many different ways to frame Amdahl's law. Right? There's mathematical frameworks that will tell you exactly you know, what the speed up is by improving a certain component of the system. That's great, right? But I think as programmers, it's, it's more important to really understand some of the more colloquial expressions of Amdahl's law, right? So here's, here's one I found that I like, right? So essentially what this is saying is that if you try to improve the performance of a system, the thing that will constrain your efforts is the performance of the parts of the system that you're not working on. Now, this kind of makes sense, right? So let's, let's say you pick a certain portion of the system to work on. What's the best you could do? to that function or that piece of the system. Like if you were, if you could wave a magic wand and you could, you could, you know, build a quantum computer or whatever, like what, 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 what's, what's the limit? What could, what could you possibly do? What's the best you could do for performance? This should be an easy question. I take a function, it takes x seconds to execute. What's the limit on the improvement I can make to that function? No, it doesn't depend. I'm saying a limit, a hard limit. Zero. zero seconds, right? I could reduce it to zero seconds, OK? And actually, sometimes that's achievable, right? Why would that be achievable? Don't do it, right? Maybe, maybe the function doesn't do anything useful, right? So I can just remove it entirely, right? Those are the best. Those are like, whoo, yes, you know? Like, I definitely, I mean, that's the easiest thing to change about a system. Just stop executing that worthless piece of code, right? Awesome, OK? Um, unlikely that's going to happen, right? But, but let's, so let's go back to our foo, foo and bar example to sort of work through a, a more foo barred example, indeed. Um, all right, so now, now let's, let's, let's look at what we could do, right? So let's say that, you know, Let's say in the roughly the same amount of time, let's say we can guess at difficulty, right? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not claiming this is possible, but let's say that we could try it. And we have the choice of reducing the execution time of foo from five minutes to one minute, or reducing the execution time of bar from five seconds to one second, right? And this is, you know, this is when Amdahl's law really starts to, 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 to mess with your mind, right? This is why, you know, despite the fact that we teach this over and over again, people have a really, really hard time putting it into practice, right? Because everything seems better about foo, right? You know, 
four minutes of improvement. I was like, wow, that's awesome. Like, that's a, that's a huge performance boost, right? And also, if you look at it proportionally, you know, 80%, I can reduce the execution of foo by 80%, you know? Maybe the problem with Amdahl's law is teaching this to like upper management, right? Because if you went to upper management and you were like, hey, I improved the fun piece of the, the, you know, the runtime of a piece of our code by 80%, right? And your buddy who's competing with you for the promotion said, oh yeah, I've reduced mine by 20%, you know? Like, you know, with, with, without some sort of deeper understanding of this, right? I mean, hey, percentages win, right? Woohoo! I, I saved four minutes off the runtime. Of a you're always going to describe it as a critical system function, right? <laughs> critical, absolutely critical. Um, so it looks like we have a clear winner here, right? And, but again, but, but, let's, but let's walk through the example, right? Let's say that this particular program, and I should have had these add up to 100, but whatever, assume there's some other function in there, you know, idle loop or, you know, stupid class or something that consumes the other 4.9%, all right? And let's just say that, again, let's say that bar, bar is where the work gets done, right? <laughs> that, that sounds wrong. Um, so <laughs> foo is, is not where the work gets done. Foo, is, foo only happens once in a while, right? Where bar, you know, like we just go back to the bar over and over and over again, okay? So the, spoo, the speed up for foo, right? What's the effective speed up? Well, say I have, you know, one minute, or did I use one minute here? I used five minutes. Why did I use five minutes? I don't know. Anyway. I, no, that's four minutes, but it's 95% of something. Anyway. So, oh, no, no. Okay, so let's say the program ran for four minutes for some reason. Why did I use four minutes? Anyway. It probably made sense to me at the time. Okay? So, the, the, the speed up that I get from improving foo, right, from five minutes to one minute. Oh, I know why. I know why. Because this is the, sorry. This is the speed up in foo, right? So this is the amount of time that I save every time foo executes, right? Foo used to take five minutes, now it takes one minute. So every time foo executes, I save four minutes. Four minutes, right? But the problem is, again, foo only executes, you know, one out of a thousand times, okay? So I'm only saving, on average, you know, 0.24 seconds every time foo runs, right? Whereas bar runs all the time, right? I'm saving one second every time bar runs. Right? The bar is running constantly. And so over any, you know, you can, you can calculate these out to see what the relative improvement would be, right? But over a long enough stretch of time, the improvement to bar is actually going to beat out the improvement to foo, right? So there were, there were three things that we needed to know to answer this problem, right? What, what, what were the three, and, and there, there's one that we haven't talked about yet. There was the whole difficulty aspect, right? So what were the three components that went into to, to computing this, right? The first one is what? Well, how do, and how am I measuring significance here? I'm using benchmarks to determine how often, what percentage of the runtime of a piece of code is spent executing a certain function, right? And this is where, you know, tracing and other things can be really helpful, right? The trace will tell you, hey, you know, your, your code spends 95% of its time executing bar, right? And then there's going to be a bunch of other functions, and then way, way down the list is this one that you were going to target for, for improvement, okay? What was the other thing I needed to know? Other numeric thing I needed to know here. What, what goes into this calculation? So significance explains this, right? This is where this number comes from, the significance or the predicted runtime of a particular function, the percentage of time that my code spent running this function. What, how, where did I get the the numbers that I'm using to multiply against it. The amount of time which reduced it. Yeah, the amount of time that I was able to reduce that, this, that, that, I, that I could have sped up foo, right? So I started working on foo, and, and the point is that, you know, I, I could have sped up foo by four minutes, we're assuming, and the same amount of time that it would have taken me to speed up bar by a second, right? And then what's the last thing that, that, that I'm kind of assuming here, right? The difficulty aspect. What, what, what could, so, so I've, I've, I've made this calculation, I've assumed that I took the same amount of time and I got four minutes of improvement on foo, one minute on bar. What's the one thing that could go wrong here that could make this turn out in the favor of foo? This is pretty close, actually, despite the fact that foo is really, really rarely run, just because foo takes so long, right? This is kind of a contrived example, right? 
What's the last thing that could, that could change here that would make foo the right thing to work on? What's that? Oh, no, no, let's just say that I'm using the right benchmarks, right? What's that? Program or effort, right? So what if it took me, you know, one day to speed up foo by four minutes and a year to speed up bar by a second, right? And, okay, sorry, I wanted to put this in here. So uh, when I worked at Microsoft, I, I worked with some people on the server performance team. And, you know, again, like they, they just go out and have a massive party for weeks on end. If they can find one cycle, one cycle on a critical path, right, on a hot path that gets executed, you know, millions of times a second, if they can find a single unnecessary cycle or a way to trim off one instruction, right, that they go out and they, they just take a month off. Right, they take a big vacation and all their clients are happy until they, they realize that there's still more fat to cut. All right. So, so here's another you know, uh, way of, of you know, colloquial expression of Amdahl's law, which is, and I think this is the, the way to think about it as programmers, right? You have to train yourself to ignore what looks bad, right? Because again, as programmers, you're going to know that that part of the code is, is really kind of gross and ugly, and I didn't really like the way I did that, stuff like that. But, but you know, again, this is, this is when the sort of computer science part comes in, right? Figure out where you're bleeding, right? What is hurting you, you know? And work on that, right? You know, that, that, that I don't, I, I'm not going to try to metaphorize this, because uh, I'll, just, I'll just do a bad job. But, um, you know, you know be, be scientists, right? You know, get, in, get into your system, understand how the system works, forget the code, right? Just forget about the code entirely for, for a while until your experiments and your profile and your benchmarks start to lead you in certain directions, right? Then you can look at the code, right? Because looking at the code might help you to, to ascertain how difficult it's going to be to make certain improvements, right? But just forget about what you think is wrong with the code because the computer doesn't agree. The computer has a very different experience of the code that you wrote, and starting with your own intuition is always the wrong thing to do when it comes to performance improvement. It will never lead you in the right direction, and if it does, it's only by accident, right? So, and, and it won't, won't uh, unlikely to ever happen again, right? Um, there's, there's also a, an interesting, unfortunate corollary to Amdahl's law, right? Amdahl's law is like a whole bag of pain. It's just like one unfortunate <laughs> conclusion after another, right? So what's the other part of Amdahl's law? Let's say you know, you, you've, you've done the right thing, you ran your benchmarks, you analyze the data, you identify the part of the system that you want to improve, and you start working on it. As you continue to work on this part of the system, what becomes more and more and more likely? You break another part. OK, that, let's say you're a good programmer. You're not going to break anything. You have great interfaces, good isolation, et cetera, et cetera. As you start to work on one part and you improve the performance of that part, what's, what's happening at the same time? What's becoming more likely? Right. So it's more and more likely that you're working on the wrong part of the system, right? So you, you, you know, again, you, you did the right thing, you ran on the experiments, you target this one piece of code, you spent a couple days working on it, and you know what? You, you did a great job with that part of code. It's no longer the problem, right? So now it's like, whoop, okay, sorry. You know, go back to square one, rerun the benchmarks, and, and this is why this is, a, this is a loop, right? So once you make a change to a piece of code, you have to, I mean, look, if that piece of code is, is killing you, right? If it's consuming 99% of the cycles on the system, then by all means, work on it for a week, right? But most of the time, that's not true. Most of the time, there's a couple of different things that are going on in different parts of the system. And you've got to, you've got to keep your balance, right? So you can't get too wedded to this one piece of code, right? You've got to get in there, make some improvements, speed it up, step back, rerun the benchmarks, go on to the next problem, right? This is the way to get a holistic improvement, right? All right. So there, there's a great, I want to finish up with this. There's a great um, paper by you know, computer science luminary Butler Lampson. Uh, which was published in, in 1983. And this was, at the time, this, I, I read this again the other night, and this was published at you know, the top systems conference for research papers. This is back at a time, you know, the, an earlier era in, in the you know, paleo history of computer science where you could actually publish papers that included the word hints um, and, and actually were, were just long and extremely useful sets of, of you know, advice 
offer to programmers as opposed to the designers. So this is a, a actually a really really good paper, uh, and I you know it, it is, you guys probably have stereotypes about what research papers are like, but this doesn't really meet them, right? This uses quotes from Hamlet. And it's got you know, lots of great examples that you probably will have to look up because, you know, again, this is 1983, right? Uh, but there's a lot of really, really, really nice uh, systems that are covered in here. And it's a, good, it's a good view into kind of the history of computer science. But the best part about it, of course, is the advice, right? Because the advice is really good and most, I shouldn't say most. As far as I know, there's nothing in it that is still not true, right? In terms of ways to look at um, how to improve systems. And really, again, you can apply this to just programming, right? How to be a good programmer, how to, how to, how to, how to complete assignments, how to, how to write good pieces of code, right? So, so one of his, uh, and, I, and I wanted, what I wanted to do is just walk through a couple of examples. There's a bunch of hints in the paper. I didn't choose all the hints about performance. Not all the hints in the paper are about performance. Some of them are about other things, right? Because performance is one aspect of building systems, and there's other aspects. Interface design is one of them that he talks about in great detail. And the other is completeness, right? How do you meet the requirements for a particular piece of code, right? Um, OK, but let's, let's look at a couple of these suggestions in the context of virtual memory, because I think that maybe you guys have been thinking about that a little bit uh, recently. So OK, one of his suggestions, cache answers, right? Cache answers. And you know, in, in, in operating systems, Caches are everywhere, right? So we've, I've introduced you, I mean, essentially, again, the operating, a, a system, a, from the perspective of the operating system, the computer is a series of caches, right, that it is trying to manage efficiently, okay? And, you know, we already know that one of the things that the memory management system is doing is helping the computer load and cache translations for, for virtual to physical addresses, right? If I don't cache those translations, the system would never work, it'd be way too slow, right? So I know about the TLB as a cache. What about a way to apply this hint, cache answers, to managing the TLB itself? So again, the TLB is a cache, right? But what's one way to, you know, that the operating system might cache information about the TLB? Let me lead you in the right direction here. When is information about the TLB lost? On the context switch, right? Why? Maybe this is obvious, but why, why? Why do I have to? Why do I lose state in the TLB when I when I switch between processes? Again, maybe obvious question, but answer it anyway. Carl, you're you're muttering over here. Well, because unless you use the PID thing, that you're going to have to. It's going to get really ugly keeping track of which virtual pages. Well, it's basically the page table for one process. Yes, there we go. That's where I was going, right? The, the page, the virtual to physical mappings, remember, it's not actually virtual address to physical address. It's virtual address comma process to physical address. Those are the mappings that are unique. So I can't, when I, when I switch processes or switch threads, I have to, you know, reload or unload and reload the TLB, okay? So what's one way? So again, I mean, this seems kind of inefficient, right? I've got this cache. But every time I do a context switch, I'm losing state in the cache. So what's one way to cache some information about the cache? What could I do that would allow that might improve the performance of the system slightly? Save the previous information at the bottom. Right. So one thing I could do in the, with the TLB, and this is not required or necessarily even going to improve performance of your system that much, but an idea would be, hey, when I stop a process from running, I've got some important information there, right? I know the TLB entries that it was caching. So rather than just clearing the TLB, why don't I unload the TLB, save those entries. When the process starts running again, I'll, rather than just starting it with the cold TLB, I'll reload those entries into the TLB and, and let it keep running, right? So again, I mean, this is a, you know, the, the, the answer here is the answer to the question, what does the process want in the TLB, right? And rather than finding out slowly, when I have to kind of forget what's in the TLB for that particular process, I can keep a copy of that answer around so that I don't have to answer that question all over again. Okay? Okay, hints. Right? Not just in the title of the paper, it's also in the title of one of his um, one of his suggestions. So hints are pieces of information that I was trying to come up with a really strong technical definition. It's hard to do. But I think the, the easiest way to explain it is. 
Hints are pieces of information that you can use to improve performance, but you cannot use in any way that indicates that they have to be correct, right? So you can use a hint to do some optimization, but you can't rely on a hint for correctness, OK? Does that distinction make any sense? Maybe an example would be better, right? <laughs> so what is, what is one way that the, the virtual memory management system already uses hints? What is, what, what is, you know, what is, I'm, I'm saying use hints, you know, take some information about the, the system and you, use it to, to, to try to improve things. Again, not in a way that, that, that you know, uh, is, is necessary for correctness. What is this similar to? What is this similar to, this mantra that we've been uh, coming back to over and over again in this class? Use the past to predict the future. Another way of framing that is use the past as a hint to what will happen in the future. Just because a process touched a page a few times doesn't mean that it has to keep using the page. Right? It can go off and use another page, and I'm not going to stop it and be like, hey, you fooled me. You know? Like, you were using that page, and I had all this special stuff set up for that page. Then you went over there? Like, no, I'll kill you. No, no, no. That's not going to happen. Right? Like, not for correctness. Right? Hints. Use the past as a hint to what might happen in the future. Okay? So what's, what's, a way, what's one area in the, in the virtual memory uh, hierarchy where this already happens? Page replacement, right? I mean, that page replacement algorithms use some form of hints. That's all they have to go on, right? They're, they're not going to, again, they're not going to require that a process tell them what pages it's going to use because the process doesn't know. And they're not going to get mad if the process goes off and uses some pages that it wasn't using a second ago. But they're just going to use the pattern of page accesses as a hint to what might happen in the future, right? Try to, to keep those pages around in case they're used again, right? All right, I think I've got one more hint. I've got two more hints, actually. One more hint. All right, compute in the background. Right? Don't leave the user waiting for something to happen. Get back to the user immediately, and then go off and, and finish the computation, or, or do any other sort of cleanup, or anything you can in the background in a way that doesn't impact interactive performance. Right? I mean, your system could be running flat out 100% utilization, but as long as Firefox loads up snappily, you don't care. You don't notice. Right? And if you're me, as long as your terminal continues to display the prompt, you know, you're fine. Right? Um, so what, what's something that virtual memory systems already do in the background to improve performance? We talked about this. What's that? Swap. Swap. Specifically what? Swap in the background, it's usually referred to as something else. Swap pages out. Yeah, cleaning. Right? Page cleaning. You know? I walk through the core map and I write out changes to disk, right? If I do that cleverly, I can use bandwidth that's available when the user is, is not using the disk heavily so that when I actually have to fault a page out or in, I've got a bunch of clean pages that are easy to get rid of, right? All right, one more hint. Shed load. And this is, this is an interesting hint, right? This has to do with, you know, your expectation as a programmer and the expectation of your system. And actually, you know, my, my advisor, my PhD advisor, did work when he was a PhD student himself on web servers that do a better job of, of managing load, right? You can imagine web servers are built for a certain degree of load. And then, you know, I mean, he, he has these, or, or I don't know where he got them, but he, you know, he, in a presentation he would give, he has these great, great, but graphs from 9-11, right? In terms of, like, the hit rates that CNN.com was seeing. Right? This was not you know, a, a normal morning in September. Right? And unfortunately, a lot of web servers, when they get into that sort of situation, rather than, so, so you, know, you can imagine the throughput of a web server, you can measure it in you know, sort of uh, page requests per second that it can serve. Right? The problem with a lot of web servers is once they hit a certain threshold, they actually degrade. Right? So rather than getting up to you know, serving 10,000 requests per second, and being able to continue to serve 10,000 requests per second, even if they've been hit with 100,000 requests. Once they get to 100, they can barely do anything. Right? They're just falling over themselves. Try, like, and so nothing happens. Right? So you sit there, and you're hitting refresh, refresh, you along with everybody else. And, it's, and, and nobody is getting any service. Right? So, so this is a, a, a bad example of how to shed load, and maybe an example of how not to shed load. But in, in what case could the virtual memory 
system get into trouble and have to start shedding load in some elegant or inelegant sort of way? Usually inelegant. Shedding load is never really that elegant. What's that? Okay so, so what, okay, so what would I do if I start to thrash? It's a great question, right? So thrash it. Don't want to thrash. Get into a thrashing sort of situation. What can I do? Fundamentally. Just start killing processes, right? So first of all, if I start running low on memory, I can stop launching new processes, right? How many people use Mac? Use Mac OS X? I just, I, I just thought of this because there's this like, have you guys ever like filled up the disk almost? to the very, very tippity top. So Mac has this great feature where the terminal tells you that it has stopped storing all of your back history to, in order to conserve space, right? It's like, oh, you've got less than a gigabyte left, so I'm going to stop storing your scroll back history. I was like, Th thanks. You know, uh, it seems like a re really the first thing that I would stop doing, right? Um, but anyway, I mean, some form of load shedding, right? So you can certainly stop launching new processes. And when you run out of memory, a lot of systems, what do they do? They just start killing processes. Right. What else can you do? Right. There's really no way out. You just have to start, you know, uh, put it, you set up a firing squad and you just try to find people that are going to help you get out of this mess. Right. And then you send an email to the system admin and you say, hey, something bad happened and I had to kill a couple processes. Right. All right. That's it for today. Wednesday, Friday, we are going to talk about virtualization. And that is going to blow your minds. Because right? virtualization is kind of like, I've, been, I've convinced you, I think, that the operating system has this privileged relationship with the hardware. Right? And this is like the moment in the Matrix series where uh, that, that old dude with the beard and the white clothes tells Neo that they've destroyed Zion like 100 times. Right? <laughs> like, this is not unique. Right? We're gonna, we're, we'll talk a little bit about virtualization and how it works. See you on Wednesday.